right, everybody, already 7 o'clock. Hard to believe, isn't it? I'm glad that you're here this evening. Let me silence this. If you haven't silenced yours, now might be a good time to do so. We are going to start with number 216 in your songbook, Dwelling in Beulah Land. And let's see, let's sing verses 1 and 2 and 4. How about that? 1, 2, and 4 of 216. Would you stand to your feet with me, please? That'll help you breathe and sing better. And the more you sing, the less you hear me. And that's a good thing for everybody. 216, verses 1, 2, and 4, dwelling in Beulah Land, 216. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in land far below the storm of doubt upon the world is beating sons of men in battle long the enemy withstand safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating Nothing then can reach me, tis Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain, underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain, that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Viewing here the works of God I sink in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice I see the way he planned. Well, in the spirit here I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Very good. Good singing tonight. So glad that you're here. I get Bet you're probably glad that I'm here. I've been gone the last two Wednesday nights. Uh, the first time in Oklahoma City, we were at a preaching conference and having a great time there. And the men that went with me said that the Lord really worked on their heart while they were there. And that's why I took them. No. Uh, and I'm glad that they, they, they had that experience and the Lord worked on my heart while we were there. And it was a very profitable time. And then, of course, last week on vacation down in Florida, we were at the Mill Creek Baptist Church. Pastor Don Ramsey 
84 years old, still pastoring. Uh, I've heard, Brother Ramsey, I guess off and on, you know, whenever we go down there, probably the last six years or so. So the first time I heard him, he was uh, a ripe old 78 and now up to 84 and he hasn't changed a bit. He's healthy as a horse. And there's a funny story. There's a bridge that he used to have to cross over the St. John's River. And the first time he preached at Mill Creek, uh, which has been like 40 or 45 years ago, he told his wife after the service, I'm never crossing this bridge again. I'm not going back to that church. And then they called him that afternoon, asked him to come back Sunday night. He came back. And so he's been saying for 45 years, I'm never crossing that bridge again, but he keeps crossing it. Amen. And that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It matters what you do do. And uh, praise the Lord. I'm glad that you're here. Let's pray and we'll get moving. Father, thank you for our church family and these Wednesday night services. Thank you for what they do for our spirit. Thank you for the way they encourage us and strengthen us. I pray tonight as we shift gears a little bit and we go to uh, a new series here for a short time that you'll help us, instruct us, teach us, and uh, use us. Help us to use what we learn so that you can use us. We pray all of this in Christ's name tonight. Amen. All right, you may be seated. If you need a prayer bulletin, raise your hand. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Excuse me. I wolfed down some dinner before we came to church, uh, a nice bowl of chili, and I washed it down with some Verner's, and I don't know if that concoction is going to be good or not throughout the course of the service. You're not supposed to eat three or four hours before you speak publicly, so if I'm ever up here, uh, uh, excuse me, that's why I probably did. All right, who has a new request or an update to an older request? Matea. Dad's feet, gotcha. All right, so pray for Matea's unspoken. Pray for her dad's foot trouble. Who else has unspokens tonight? Raise your hand. Let's do them all. Brent Dix. All right, Aaron. Journey. Lucy. Joanna. Talon, Ken, Shireen. All right, anybody else that I missed? All right, very good. <clears throat> Who then else would have a new request or an update to an older request? Joanna. Yeah, good. Good. Praise the Lord. Pray for Joanna's mother, still recovering and rehabbing from surgery, and we hope that she gets out of that soon back home, right? Yes, Ellen. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Good. Is he with you still? Is he at your house still back home? Good. Praise the Lord. That's positive, isn't it? Amen. Ten. Oh, do they really? Okay. Yep. Mayfair up on Pearson Road there, just west of Linden. So pray for that pastor and uh, his wife as they recover from COVID, please. All right. Russell. Yep. Gotcha. All right, so pray for Russ. Torn meniscus in his left knee. So if you're going to kick him in the knee, kick him in the right knee, would you? Uh, but in all seriousness, pray for that left leg. Go into the specialist to figure out what needs to be done further. How'd your dentist appointment go? Four fillings in two days. Too many M&Ms, Russell. Uh, whoever's passing out candy tonight, no candy for Russ. No. <laughs> Talon. Okay. 
pray for Talon's mom and her health problems. All right, Joanna. Oh, really? The kids have COVID? Wow, hmm, that's very unusual. All right. So pray for this family with COVID. Who else? Lucy, did your hand go up? No, Terry? No, Katrina? Amen. Wow, good for you. Praise the Lord. That's a tough one. I hear. I don't know. I hear that. I hear that's a tough one to kick. So do you have any fingernails left? Right. <laughs> yes. Good for you. Good for you. Pray for Katrina that she keeps getting victory over the smoking, please. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so that's going to take the place of that, huh? Right. Gotcha. All right. Very good. Anything else? Brent? Yep. Pray for Jeanette's health. And Shannon also uh, is out sick tonight. So pray for her, please. Uh huh. Anything else? Going once and twice, three times. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and thank you for again these midweek services. I guess I'd miss it because I was gone for these two weeks, and it's really good to be back. Thank you for the way our church family shares our burdens one with another. As you tell us to in Galatians, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We bring our burdens to you tonight, and we have needs, and we ask that you'd meet these needs. You've been meeting them, Father. I've been getting answers from you nearly daily here for the last couple of weeks, and I'm thankful. Would you please meet these prayers again today? The unspoken needs are from Matea, Brent, Aaron, Journey, Lucy, Joanna, Talon, Ken, and Shireen. Would you please meet these needs for these folks? Uh, we see the same people sometimes week after week asking, and I wonder if that's because it's not been met yet, or maybe it's a new need. Either way, Father, please grant their requests, and soon, we pray for Jeanette tonight and Shannon and their health condition. Would you be with both of these ladies? Also Talon's mom having some health problems. Would you help each one of these three ladies as they carry whatever malady they have? Help their body to fight back against it. Help anything that the doctors might be doing uh, to also help with it. We pray for Russ and the knee problem that he has, the torn meniscus. Those things usually don't fix themselves, but he may be able to avoid surgery. Lord, if that be the case, would you do that for him? He works a job where he's on his feet and has to be active, and we know that's painful. He teaches a class, and he's on his feet to teach. He's on the bus route, and he's on his feet to do the route. Father, would you please work with him and, and touch his body? Father, if you'd heal him, that'd be a wonderful thing. But just do what's best for him, please. We pray for the pastor and his wife up at Mayfair on Pearson Road. Would you be with these two servants of God? Help them to recover well. Help them to recover quickly. May it not be serious for them. We pray for Ellen's son, Chris, as he continues to rehab. We're thankful uh, for the physical therapy doing its job. Thankful that there's no more pain since the last recurrence. Please allow that to continue to be the case. Work in his heart, work in his life, work in his marriage, Father. I pray that you'd turn his affections to his mom and to you, please. We pray for Joanna's mom as she continues to recover. Thank you for the time she has left. We pray that it be used well and that she'd rehab and get home soon. 
We pray for Mark and his continued foot problems. He's taking care of these kids and a uh, single parent, making sure all their needs are met. Would you bless him and help him? Strengthen him, Father. Would you draw him close to you? We pray for the kids on Route 1, this particular family, and the young people, even with coronavirus, help them to bounce back. No long-term, uh, long-lasting repercussions from it, but may they get through this quickly and protect this newborn, please. And then we pray for Katrina and this victory that she's had. We're grateful for it. Five days, no cigarettes. That's exciting. Help her to continue to have the victory. Her body is going to fight this, and the temptation is going to be there physiologically. Help her to resist it. The temptation will also be there psychologically. Help her to resist it. Tear down the stronghold in her life and help her to have victory in yet one more area, please. We sure do love you tonight. We're thankful that we can pray. Thank you that you hear us and that you hear these prayers and that you'll answer them as we've asked and you promised you'd do that. Ask and we shall receive. Seek and we shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto us. Lord, grant that to us tonight, please, in Christ's name. Amen. Very good. Tuck that away, please, and pray for those needs as you go through your week. All right, who wants to pass out candy? Matea, you interested? You don't have to be. You don't have to be. You want to do it or not? Yes? Okay, come on down. Aaron, you want to pass out candy? All right, very good. I don't know what's going on candy-wise these days. Oh, Hershey's Miniatures. Nobody likes these. Let me put them away. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know these just explode on you is what happens. Four pieces, 170 calories. See? That's what happens. This is terrible. I'm going to give this to you, Aaron. Manage it the best you can. Oh, see there? They're leaking out the backside here. All right. Let's see if I can do any better for Matea. Probably not, right? Oh, it was better. But still torn. Be careful. I'm sorry, Aaron. Oh, you know what, Aaron? Grab one of them buckets. Fill that bucket up with all those, and uh, we'll go that route. That'll work. All right, crackles. Who likes crackles? All right, we'll have an invitation at the end. You can get saved. All right, this is from the book of Acts. Beginner Bible students, you can use your Bibles if you consider yourself advanced. Don't use it. How about that? Let's see how far you get. 50 questions. Should we just rapid fire these? Ah, question number one. Who wrote the book of Acts? Did Brent. No, sorry. Sharon Stiff. Luke, that is correct. Number two. To whom was it written? Talon. Theophilus, correct. Number three. What did Jesus say the believers would be baptized with? Talon. Holy Ghost, correct. What would they receive? Sharon Stiff. Power, that's correct. What were they to be? Rick. Witnesses, correct. How many, I'm sorry, yeah, how many were in the upper room? Terry. 120. What were they doing up there? Talon. Praying. You're candied out, right, Talon? All right. Next. Which disciple was being replaced? Russell. Judas. Judas. That's correct. How did they choose his replacement? Brent. Cast lots. That is correct. Who was his replacement? Sharon Stiff. Matthias. You're candied out? All right. That's chapter one. See how that works? Chapter two. How were the disciples able to speak with other tongues? Charles. Terry. That's correct. The Holy Spirit gave them utterance. What was the day called in Acts chapter 2? Journey. Pentecost. Correct. Who spoke on this day? Brent. Peter. Can't eat out now? No? Oh. oh, you gave me a wrong answer, didn't you? All right. What Old Testament was, prophet was quoted by Peter during his sermon? 
Terry. Sorry. Journey? Sorry. Rick? Not Moses. Brent? Not David. Dad? Nope, not Job. Brooke? Not Elijah. Ellen? That's correct. Joel. I'm so disappointed in all the rest of you. What did those who gladly received his word do? Winston. They were baptized. Correct. How many people were saved on Pentecost? Rick? 3,000. That is correct. Chapter 3. What did Peter say he had none of? Winston? Silver and gold. That's correct. What did Peter give the man instead of money? Rick? That's correct. He gave him the ability to walk. Very good. You're candied out now, Rick? All right. Chapter 4. What kind of men did the council believe the disciples to be? Winston. Not drunkards. Good guess. You're very close. We are not drunken as you are supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's almost like, give us time, buddy. Anybody know what the third hour of the day is? Well, 9 a.m., yeah, not technically. All right, anybody know this answer, Nick? That's correct. Unlearned and ignorant men. That's exactly what we were looking for. Ah, what did the council command the disciples? Winston. That's correct. Are you candied out now? Okay. Ah, uh, next. Who sold land and gave it to the apostles? Ellen? Sorry. Russell? Barnabas. We're still in chapter 4, Ellen. What married couple? <laughs> Ellen? That's correct. Also promised to sell land and give the money to the disciples. What happened to them? Talon? No, you're candied out. Charles? They died. That is correct. Can anyone tell me why? This has to be on point. Journey? To who? Yes, they lie to the Holy Ghost. Next, what Pharisee defended the disciples? I need a name. A member of the council of Pharisee. Brent? Okay. Anybody know? Journey? Yeah, Gamaliel. That's exactly right. Good job. Chapter 6. Why were the Grecians upset? Nicole? Their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. That is correct. What was the solution the disciples gave? Dad? Sort of. Right. They, they chose seven men to handle the distribution of the needs. So you're correct. All right, look at Aaron. He lets people choose what they get. How generous. Next, why shouldn't the disciples have been involved in this work? Terry? That's exactly right. They were to continue to give themselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word of God, which means study of the Scriptures and the preaching of the Scriptures, soul-winning efforts. Next. Uh, are you candied out now, Terry? Okay. What man was accused of speaking blasphemies? Russell? Stephen. That is correct. All right. Thank you for being honest about it. Russ? with those four cavities we're disappointed you took any candy <laughs> chapter 7 what happened to Stephen Brent he was stoned that is correct chapter number 8 what magician was saved what magician Nick Simon that's correct are you candied out now 
All right. Next, what did Simon want to buy? What did Simon want to buy? Yes, ma'am. Not a piece of land. Good guess, Matea. Ellen. I'm going to give you that. The ability to grant the Holy Ghost unto others. You candied out now, Ellen? Wow. All right, those of you who are not candied out, get your Bibles open. It's your, your time now. Half this crowd is candied out, I think. Ah, uh, what was the eunuch reading? What book of the Bible? was the eunuch reading, the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading a book of the Bible. It was not Mark. Good guess. Dad? Yes, that is correct. Or Isaiah. <clears throat> Who helped him understand what he was reading? Who helped him? Katrina? Philip, that is correct. What did the eunuch do after he trusted Christ? Dad? He was baptized, that is correct. Chapter number 9. Where was Saul heading when Jesus appeared in his path? Where was Saul heading? Brooke? That's correct, Damascus. How long was Saul blinded? Charles? Sir? No, give me a number of days. Sorry. Joanna? Three days. Very good. Who was told to take Saul in? The name of the man instructed to receive Saul. Katrina? That's correct. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Sorry. It is correct. My fault. Next. What woman did Peter raise from the dead? The name. Name of the woman Peter raised from the dead. Anyone? Brooke? Tabitha, that's correct. To what Gentile man, chapter 10, was Peter sent to witness? Chapter 10. What Gentile man was Peter sent to to witness? Oh, yes, Joanna. Cornelius, that is correct. You can't eat out now, Joanna? No? Okay. What made Cornelius stand out to God? Charles? What made Cornelius stand out to God? something about him. Charles, go ahead. He's reading down the chapter. Okay. What came up as a memorial before God? Lucy. That's correct. His prayers and his alms. Next, uh, chapter number 11. What happened when Peter came back to Jerusalem? These might get a little tougher. Should we start inviting people back in? Let's see what time it is. 7.29. At 7.30, everyone's back in. Charles? Sorry. Month, wait, it's not 7.30 yet. You're candied out. Katrina. No, that's not it. Good guess. All right, everybody's in. Mother? Mm, no, that's not it. Talon? Right. Is that what you intended to say? It is? All right. Give them both candy. I, I misinterpreted your answer. All right. Next. Um, 
Where were the disciples first called Christians? I'll be honest with you, I've lost track of the chapters at this point, so you're on your own. I guarantee it's, it's, chap, it's probably chapter 16 or 17. But I, I say this once every four weeks, so if you're listening. Katrina? Antioch, what chapter was that? Or did you just know it? Oh, it's 11? <laughs> I'm misleading you. All right, chapter 12. Who was killed by Herod with the sword? Talon. Sorry, Michelle. James. Welcome to the game, Michelle. Next, who was arrested to be killed next? Talon. Journey. Peter. John the Baptist is long dead by the book of Acts. Next, uh, how was Peter delivered from prison? Joanna? No, that's not how he was delivered. Brent? That's correct. You'll get candy for that, but can you give me what brought that about? Rick? Prayer. Prayer. That's right. The, the people were praying. He gets one. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I don't mean to call you sir, but I've been calling Nicole sir all week. I think it's the way she talks to me. That's why. Anyway. Yes, sir. Um, who met Peter at the gate? Talon. Yes, the ghost of John the Baptist. At least he's not saying Jesus over and over again. Ash, not Mary. Journey, Rhoda, that is correct. Is that Mary Tyler Moore's sister? Is that who Rhoda was? I don't remember. I was a kid back then. Who? Oh, just a friend. Rhoda's friend. Rhoda's a friend. Of it. Anyway. Uh, they have a statue of Mary Tyler Moore in Minneapolis. Did you know that? It's pretty weird. Anyhow, who did Barnabas and all take with them to... Oh, no. <laughs> who did Barnabas and, and Paul take with them to minister? Right? Yes, John Mark or Mark. Who tried to keep Barnabas and Paul from Sergius Paulus? Screeching hall. Brett? No. No. Terry? Yep, yeah, it's open. No, no. You guys are ahead of me. Mother? Nick? No. Oh, no. Let me listen. Who tried to keep Barnabas and Saul from Sergius Paulus? Uh huh. Anybody? Bar Jesus. Make sense now? Yeah. Next, two questions left. What happened to Bar Jesus as a result? You're falling apart here, right at the end. No, ma'am. Sorry. Good guess. I know. Uh huh. Struck blind. Last question. What did Barnabas and Paul do when they weren't received in a city? Brent. That's correct. They shook the dust off their feet. All right. That was a lot of questions. A lot of candy. My goodness. I'm going to go broke that way. All righty. Oh. much. I forgot. My apologies. No business meeting tonight. Let me explain why. Everyone. Yes, ma'am. 
unless they refuse, don't force it on them. Uh, so I, I think I explained that uh, our CPA works from home and they had a, a bit of a disaster in their home. The beginning sounds very domestic and then it'll get more impressive as we go on. But they have this sink that they filled full of dishes, heavy pots and pans, and, uh, and filled it full of water to soak these pans. Well, their sink fell right through the countertop. When it fell through the countertop and hit the bottom of the cabinet, the sink shattered into pieces. All of the water then went down into the cabinetry, down into the hardwood floors, and it actually ran, I, this was new information I got, ran down a heat run and it poured directly into their in-home server that stores all of their information. So they've spent the last, I don't know, six weeks rebuilding their entire home server and system. Much of what they use, both hardware and software for us, had to be rebuilt, reinstalled, and then there are some system-specific softwares that they use just for us because QuickBooks is not very friendly to nonprofits. If you buy QuickBooks, very helpful if you're running a for-profit business, but their nonprofit side is not helpful at all. They actually manage to recover all of our data, which is very, very good. And we expected to be able to have our business meeting tonight. Then I got word Friday, thank you ma'am, that it, it was going to be close. I said, okay, close, fine. Then I got word Monday that it wasn't going to happen at all. I could read you the long texts about it all. It would just bore you and you may not even understand all of it. I don't understand all of it. All I know is we don't have our information. So I was going to go ahead, because here's what happens. When we miss our deadline for our business meeting, um, which is static anyhow, we just continue operating under the same budget we've been operating on for the previous year. And so we've been continuing to do that. And I was told we'll be ready for next week. So we're pushing the business meeting to next week. If by chance it doesn't happen next week, then we're just going to have the business meeting anyhow. But I'm told with some great certainty that we should be ready to go. Now, uh, the truth is, for the past four or five, maybe even six or seven years, our budget has changed very little anyhow. Uh, we pretty much bring in the same amount of money every year. It goes out in the same manner that it goes out in every year. So anyhow, my apologies. I don't mean to keep delaying you. It's not on me, unfortunately. I mean, I'd like to bear the burden of responsibility. It's just our CPA and their whole system. So I'm going to switch mics here now, Ashton. Uh, so I apologize that there won't be a business meeting tonight. For all I know, you're going to be grateful there's no business meeting tonight. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much a formality, as I say at this point, because our budget stays pretty much the same. Although I do have one issue of business that's going to be brand new to discuss. All right, so we're in a new series here tonight uh, talking about how to be a laborer for God. And I don't know how long this is going to last. I certainly don't think it'll be as lengthy as our local church series was. It's certainly going to be much more practical than our local church series was. And I'm not apologizing for the local church series. Probably one of the most important and strongest Bible studies we've had in 18 years was that local church series and it's vital to the longevity of this church I was talking to a couple of pastors on Monday Shannon and I I took her to lunch and we sat down next to uh, a couple of men who were talking and I could hear them talking about the Bible and I could hear one of them talk say and I mentioned to one of the deacons and, and so I knew these were church going folks already and uh, so I said well I'm not going to invite them to Easter Sunday sounds like they're already ready to go but Shannon had some plexiglass between her and them so she couldn't hear any of their discussion and uh, so 
as we were getting ready to depart, she took out an Easter invite and said, hey, I want to invite you two guys to church. And uh, they said, oh, that's funny. We're pastors. And they each pastor a Baptist church here in Flint. And so as we were leaving the restaurant, Shannon said, because they're supposed to come Sunday night because they don't have evening service. But as we were leaving, Shannon said, so I guess they don't count for the contest being Baptist pastors and all. <laughs> and I said, you're right. They don't count for the contest. But they're supposed to be here anyhow. But we had a little bit of conversation, and it was interesting to me how many things that they and I were discussing that had come up in our local church series. So that is certainly one for the books. I hope you don't regret having gone through it, and I hope that it you learned a lot from it. I hope that it helped you, and I also hope that those are principles that our church will decide to stand on from here forward as long as the Lord tarries. So we're going to go to Luke chapter number 10 tonight. The title of this lesson, and these are going to be a bit of a shotgun type lessons. By that I mean they're going to be sporadic. There's not going to be any sequencing intentionally in them and that kind of thing. We're going to talk about the growth of a soul winner tonight. As we're heading into Easter Sunday and our spring program, I want to help us a little bit. I want to instruct us and give us some helps as we're all going to be working very hard to get people into church over the next nine weeks. So let's read through Luke 10. If you remember, we read verses 1 through 7 on Sunday morning for our morning message. We're going to go all the way to verse number 24 tonight, and we're not going to get into great detail about it, but know this, this is Christ training his disciples to be soul winners. That's what this whole chapter is about. Now, he's not giving them the principles of the Romans road and that kind of thing, but he's teaching them many tips and techniques, and who knows, maybe we'll return to this by the time it's all said and done. But let's go ahead and pray together, please, and then we will begin. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and we're thankful that you're, you desire to use us as witnesses of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We discussed it in our quiz. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. God, would you empower each one of us tonight? We need your power to do your work. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak through us as we speak to others about Jesus Christ. Help us to make a difference in this area, please. We love you tonight, and we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also. So other than the 12, he has the 12 disciples. Now he has 70 more disciples. We're at 82 disciples. And he sent them two and two, or we might say two by two, groups of two, teams of two, just like we're doing for our program. Some of you are going solo at it. Some of you are teaming up with one other person. But it's two and two. It's wise to go two by two because we have someone to help us stay accountable and someone to help give us boldness. What happened to Peter when he was left alone the night of, of Christ's trials? He denied the Lord. I guarantee you, if John had been sitting beside him, he wouldn't have. I believe that with my whole heart. Why did he deny the Lord? Because he was alone. And when we're alone... We're not as bold. In fact, when we're alone, we're sometimes cowardly. Having someone with us to be accountable helps us do the things we ought to do. Secondarily, uh, it's for the matter of safety. Two are better than one. The book of Ecclesiastes talks about that. It even says a threefold cord uh, isn't broken. And so having a partner gives you a bit of safety. Thirdly, when we go two by two, we encourage one person to do the talking and the other person to be a silent partner. Now, the silent partner is still vital and has great responsibility. Number one, it's to be praying. 
when I'm with someone, Brent and I were visiting the bus route a couple weeks ago, and he was witnessing to a bus dad named Jesse. He's giving Jesse the gospel, and the whole time that he was doing that, I was standing there saying, God, let him listen. Please give Brent the words to say, give him boldness, help him to have a clear mind as he witnesses, and please let Jesse listen. Let him hear what's being said. Then some kids are running around in the background behind Jesse. And so now I'm saying, Lord, shut them kids up and don't let them uh, interfere with all this. So I'm praying. I'm the silent partner. Now, if I had been in the house and Jesse were on the couch, we were standing on the porch, and Brent and I were sitting there, and the kids started, you know, acting up or something or being loud, I might try to help them some. Hey, let me see that race car. You know, and now I'm going to engage those kids so that Brent can keep Jesse engaged. So the, the role of a silent partner is very, very important. So that's another reason to have two by two. Let's keep reading. Uh, he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. So they're basically, uh, you know, getting everything ready for Christ to show up. They're preparing the way for the Lord to come to, to these cities. Number two, therefore said he unto them. So now he's going to start talking and teaching them and training them how to go forth. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. So when he says the harvest is great, it means there's a lot to be harvested. Not just, hey, isn't that a great harvest? Doesn't it taste good? It's a tasty harvest? Uh, no, it's the quantity he's speaking of. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And that shows the contrast there. He says, based on the amount of work we have to get done versus how many workers we have, we're short-handed. The harvest is great. By the way, the harvest is still great. Shannon won two people to Christ today. She, she won one of our bus moms to the Lord. I was very excited about it because I've been by that house Man, half a dozen times with the goal of witnessing to this mom and the thing is she talks so much I can't even get her to listen long enough to give the gospel to her and so Shannon was able to do that today I don't know what that says about Shannon uh, she's watching from home tonight Hi, baby. anyway uh, but but she was able to get her to listen and she won her to Christ today uh, so what am I saying here oh so people are still getting saved People will get saved if we witness to them and, uh, and get the gospel to them. So the, the harvest is great, the laborers are few, and then we told you Sunday, this is the Lord's only prayer request in the Bible, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now I hope that's on your prayer list. It's on our Wednesday night prayer list if you look under the church heading, laborers. Pray that God would send laborers to our church and pray that God would make those of us who are already here his laborers. Hence this study, right? Verse 3, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. So first notice he says go. Laborers have to go. Yeah, we're not even to your handout sheet yet, by the way. Laborers have to go. You know, there's no such thing as coronavirus working at home for the Lord, right? Your company may have sent you home, but the work of the Lord can't be done from home. Now, if you really want to split hairs with me, I did mention calling people on the telephone. You could maybe witness online through, uh, you know, FaceTime or something like that. You might pull that off. But by and large, the work of the Lord is done out in the field. There's two types of churches. There are evangelistic churches and there are soul winning churches. Well, there are three types of churches. There are evangelistic churches, soul winning churches, and dead churches. Dead churches don't see anyone saved ever. Evangelistic churches have the goal of bringing visitors to church so that the preacher can preach the gospel to them so that they'll get saved in church. Soul winning churches go out into their communities with the gospel and try to win people to Christ. Brother Rick won somebody to the Lord just last week, uh, one of the delivery men to his store. Uh, he was able to keep there for long enough to witness to him and win him to Christ. So that's going. That's being out in the community. There are some churches that if you can't get inside the four walls of the church, 
Nobody in that church is going to win you to Christ. you got to show up to a service so the preacher can preach you down the aisle, if you will. And so when he says go, he's saying be a soul-winning church. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a soul-winning evangelistic church. You know, it would be almost foolish to, to say, okay, we always go in the community, but if you show up here lost, we're not going to help you, right? That's, that's stupid. At the same time, think about evangelistic churches, and I've been to some of these. What if every single Sunday morning, all I preach to you is a salvation message? You'd grow weary of that. And it wouldn't be helping you or feeding you. And so while we'll, we'll get the gospel peppered throughout the message, most of my sermons are not salvation-specific or only type messages. Something like Easter may lean that way a little bit more because we expect a few more visitors or, or unsaved people here. But by and large, the goal is to feed the sheep, and if someone lost shows up or some guests that we don't know, we'll get the gospel to them so that they might have a home in heaven someday. So first he says, go, and then he says, I send you forth, which is what? Go. Both of these mean go. Go, I'm sending you. Then he says, as lambs among wolves. And we talked about that Sunday. We are to be sincere and harmless. We're not to be looking for personal gain or to manipulate other people as we go. You know, that, that's not the goal. And, you know, the Lord takes care of you when you go. We were uh, on the north side of town a couple of years ago, I remember, and knocking doors. It was a really, really hot day. And knocked on the door, and a lady said, Oh, my goodness, what are you doing out here? I mean, we're glad you're from the church, and we're glad you're in our neighborhood, but you must be awfully thirsty. And she gave us some Fago, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and invited us into the house to cool down a little bit. And praise the Lord for that. But if you say, Man, I'm going soul winning if I get Fago. Well, now you're not doing it for the proper reasons, right? Now you're going to go to wolves, people who will manipulate you, who will try to take advantage of you, and you've got to be aware of that. You've got to be looking for it to happen. Verse number 4, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. That's talking about don't worry about your physical needs being met. They'll be taken care of. And then he finishes, and salute no man by the way, meaning... Be about the business you're supposed to be getting done. Don't waste time. You're out there for a purpose, and so the salute is talking about taking inordinate amounts of time for common social pleasantries. Have you ever had anybody in your life who, who knows perfectly how to waste your time? You, you, you see them coming, and you're like, oh, no, I don't have 10 minutes for this guy, right? Right? Or you see somebody call on your phone and you're like, not today. I don't have time for this kind of phone call today. Uh, and so that's what he's saying. Don't waste time. Get out there and get the job done. Next, verse number 5. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. So always go in with optimism. You don't know who you're going to meet, who's going to be there. You don't know if there's a divine appointment set up by God. And so be aware of who's in the house. Uh, I'm sorry, be optimistic about whoever's in the house when you first show up. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. And as we mentioned Sunday, the son of something is someone who's known for certain characteristics. So you can be the son of peace. You can also be the son of wrath. You can be the son of joy. You can be the son of anger. Uh, you can be the son of patience. You can be the son of impatience. So whatever you find, if you find the son of peace there, then your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again, saying, you know, if you run into something that you don't expect, don't worry about it. It doesn't have to affect you. It doesn't have to affect your spirit. Shannon was out visiting, uh, and she was telling me that she pulled into somebody's driveway and there it was a hard she couldn't really tell if it was a driveway or a yard have we all seen houses like this is this you know other people are parked on the grass driveways kind of full is it okay to pull up in this certain spot so she does and she's at the door and she's talking to somebody and then another car pulls in and uh, a gruff older guy says 
nice of you to park in my yard like that. And he doesn't even look at her. And she said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I saw other cars there. I wasn't quite sure. And he doesn't even respond to her. He just walks past her and doesn't say a word. He said, well, what do you do when something like that happens? Nothing. You should ignore him. Doesn't matter. He didn't respond to her. She doesn't have to respond to his lack of response. Now, you can take it personally if you want, end up in a fist fight rolling around in the front yard. But the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So you don't make it personal. You just let it go. Let your peace return to you and move on. But you see how it does bother us, doesn't it? Because she comes home and tells me what happened. Because the devil will use that to get in our head and to get us frustrated. Next, verse 7. In the same house, remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So if you find a house that receives you, these people get saved and they say, hey, stay here tonight. Let us feed you. Let us take care of you. Let us be hospitable. Then accept it. Don't say, oh, no, 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 no. And then go without. Then you're like, man, I'm starving and God doesn't take care of his servants. No, he does. You just said no to it. It's the story of the old guy down there when all the levees broke in New Orleans. You know, the, uh, the water comes up to his knees and the sheriff's department rolls by in their four-wheel drive and says, hey, buddy, get in the truck. We'll take you to safety. No, no, God will take care of me. Then the, the, the water gets up to his neck and then they roll by in a raft with a motor on the back of it. Hey, buddy, get in the raft. Let us take you to safety. No, no, God will take care of me. Then it comes above the roof line of his house, so he's sitting on the roof of the house, the peak of the house. Helicopter comes by, lets down a ladder. Guy with a megaphone says, hey, buddy, climb the ladder. We'll take you to safety. No, no, God will take care of me. They fly away. The waters rise. The man drowns. He gets to heaven. He goes and hunts out down the Lord. He says, Lord, I told all these people you'd take care of me, but you let me drown. He said, dummy, I sent you a truck, a raft, and a helicopter. What else do you want? Look, God gives you stuff, but you in your false humility refuse it, thinking you're spiritual, and then you go without, and you wonder why. God tried to take care of you. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Verse 8, And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is nigh unto you. So he's telling them exactly what to do, isn't he? When you're received, sit at their table. Have the meal with them. If they're sick, heal them. And tell them the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not. Go your ways out into the streets of the same and say even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us we do wipe off against you notwithstanding be ye sure of this that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city woe unto thee Chorazin unto thee Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. It's pretty harsh. So what do you do when somebody receives you? You eat their food, you heal their sick, and you tell them that the kingdom of God is coming. You witness to them. You win them to Christ. What if they reject you? Tell them the kingdom of God is coming to them too, even if they're rejecting it, and they will be thrust down to hell. And it will be more tolerable in the day uh, of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for them. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Our teenage girls, we were on a street in Burton one day, one of these off of Saginaw Street that, that head uh, east from Saginaw Street, and we were at a they dead end down by that elementary school back in there by Bentley. I think it's Bentley. 
uh, I don't know, one of the two. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we're going along, and uh, this this giant guy comes out on his porch like he's, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk kind of fee fi fo fum. And it was Nicole, and this was probably, man, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, and she had another young teenage girl with her. And uh, this guy came out on his the deck of his house, and he's four feet above the girls. And he, you get out of my yard. I don't want you peddling your religion around here. Just get out of here. And if you come on this yard, you'll see what happens to you. And then he's like, why don't you go get me the leader of this group anyway? So Nicole looks across the street. I'm over there talking to a sweet old lady. That's how I try to do it. I try to talk to the sweet old ladies, and I send all the teenagers to the rough, mean, fee fi fo men. But, uh, and, 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 you know, and so as soon as she says, this dad, this guy's over here yelling at us, telling us that if we didn't get off his property, he was going to hurt us. Well, you know, that's the way she words it to me. So now it starts in my toes, right? And, uh, and I go over there and I said, sir, you have a problem? He said, yeah, I don't want you on this street at all. I said, it doesn't sound like that's your call to make. If you don't want us on your property, we won't come on your property. But you don't have the right to tell us on that we can't be on the street. If I see you on the street again, I'll call the police. I said, call them right now. We're not doing anything illegal. And by the way, we're not. And by the way, it's not trespassing to solicit at someone's door unless there is a sign that says no soliciting. And I encourage you, and I do it myself, if there's a sign that says no soliciting, I don't knock on the door. I don't ring the doorbell. Why irritate somebody who doesn't want you? I will often leave a track. Now, if there's a no soliciting, a no trespassing, and a this pro house is guarded by Smith & Wesson, I won't even leave a track. Clearly, they don't want you there, right? Uh, we get calls almost weekly. People with nothing better to do with their time than call us to complain that we left a track on their door. So to me, that's mind-boggling. You really, like if I came home and True Green Lawn Care left a, a hanger on my door frame, I'm not going to go inside, call True Green and say, I don't want you leaving any more literature on my door. I'm too busy for that. But there's a lot of kooks out there that aren't. And there's a lot of God-haters that are glad to just read us the riot act for simply trying to bring the gospel to them. So what Jesus is saying is, don't sweat those fools. You don't have to worry about these people. They will have their day of judgment, and God will see to it that they're thrust in hell. Now, that's not our goal. That's not what we're after. But don't let these fools rattle you. Let's keep moving. What time are we looking at? All right. Ah, verse 17. And the 70 returned again. Oh, no, no, 16. And here, this is, this is very helpful for us to know. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Here's what that verse is saying. It's not about you. And it's not about me. You say, man, that guy listened and I want him to Christ. I'm an amazing soul winner. No, you're not. You're just a faithful mouthpiece. Speaking of John the Baptist talent, John the Baptist said, I am a voice crying in the wilderness. I love it. I'm a voice. That's all we are. When you're a witness, you're a voice. And when we knock on a door and we share Christ with someone, we're a voice. We're irrelevant. They don't know us. We really don't know them. We have a message God wants them to hear. If they want it and they receive it gladly, praise God they heard His voice through mine. When they hear His voice, they're hearing the voice of the Father. That's what He's saying. When they reject us, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Him. And when they say no to Christ, they're saying no to Him. Next verse. And the 70 returned again with joy. So things went well for these folks saying, and look at what they're excited about. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They're out there casting out devils. They didn't think they were going to be able to do that. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy 
and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And so he's saying, yes, I watched Satan fall from heaven. He is a defeated foe, and you, by my power, are able to cast out these demons. And then he says to them that they have power over serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall hurt them. Now let me tell you, when we got back out there soul winning, the first week we were out, we were on, I don't know, Indiana or Illinois Street. And almost every group that was knocking on that street, you heard them say to you, you need to be careful out here. You, you need to get back on that bus and get out of here. You don't know where you are. Let me tell you something else. So other places in the city, I hear that from the residents. Every place in the city. There isn't a neighborhood that I knock on that somebody doesn't say, you be careful out here. I hear it everywhere I go. And you know what? The Lord watches over us. I've been soul winning for 35 years, 39 years, 7 years, I don't know, over 30 years. And uh, over 35 years, no harm's ever come to me. And I've met a lot of fifi fo fum giants on their, their porches. We're fine. I've never known anyone get hurt out soul winning. I mean, they might trip and fall but no one's ever brought harm to anyone. I went to Hiles Anderson College in northwest Indiana. It was five miles or so, uh, maybe eight miles from the Illinois line. We went into Chicago every weekend of the world. Our young ladies from the college would go into Chicago every weekend of the world. Minimum groups of two. We'd go into Chicago, and, and, and we weren't just downtown at the Sears Tower and Lakeshore Drive. We're in the neighborhoods of Chicago. Us guys would go and do south side of Chicago in the Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor homes. And we'd go in there and we'd have a, a Bible or a New Testament visible and no harm ever came to any of us. Those young ladies out on the streets of Chicago, Kedzie Avenue and places like that, no harm ever came to any of them girls. Never. Didn't happen. Now, at the same time, nobody was running their mouth. Nobody was acting a fool. You know, you treat people decent. They treat you decent. They know you're from the church. You got a Bible in your hand or you're passing out tracts. In fact, Robert Taylor Holmes, it'd start to get dark, and people come up to us and say, all right, boys, you need to go now. Not like, go now or we're going to hurt you. It's getting dark. You ought to go. Watch it out for us. Huh. What a concept. Don't be afraid to go soul winning. Now be smart. Don't run your mouth. Don't act a fool. But uh, don't be afraid either. Next, verse number 20. Notwithstanding, in this I rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name's written in heaven. Saying, you know, don't get excited about the ability to cast out devils. Be excited that you're saved. That's what you really ought to be thrilled about. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. First off, notice Jesus rejoiced. What did he rejoice in? These 70 people out witnessing. Soul winning makes Jesus happy. Soul winning makes the Father happy. People getting saved causes the Father to rejoice in the presence of the angels. God loves it when people get saved, and He loves it when His people are faithful to tell others about Christ. And then He says here, notice, uh, I thank Thee that Thou hast revealed it unto the babes, not the wise and the prudent. You know, some people think they're too good to be a soul winner. They're too smart to be a soul winner. They grow beyond that. Well, they've grown beyond obedience. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So he tells his disciples, hey, pay attention to what's going on with these 70 people. 
because there have been prophets and kings of the past would have loved to see what you're able to see happening with these people. They're growing. They're excited. They're witnessing. And people are being converted and healed through their efforts. Don't you want God to use you that way? Now let's shift gears and get into our, our outline here as we talk about the growth of a soul winner. Number one, every Christian is commanded by God to be a soul winner. Some people say, well, there, there are gifts of the Spirit, and I don't have that gift. Soul winning is not listed in any gifts of the Spirit. Soul winning is a command of God. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. And that word ye is plural you. It's talking to his people. Every Christian is commanded by God to be a soul winner. You say, that me? Are you a Christian? Then yes, that's you. We're all to be soul winners. Number two, in our text, Christ is training his disciples to be soul winners. Christ is training his disciples to be soul winners. Number three, everyone needs training to be a soul winner. Everyone needs training to be a soul winner. Now, don't get me wrong. It can occur naturally by giving our testimony to our close friends and family. When I first got saved, and I told this a week or two ago, the first two people I witnessed to were close friends of mine, and I just gave them my testimony, and I used a track to witness to them. So you can do some of that. But I'll tell you what I, I also did. I really, really, really twisted their arm and coerced them, and they both prayed to be saved. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure either one of them meant it. Now, I leave it completely up to God. But the reason I say I'm not sure they meant it is because they had me there ready to drag them along on my journey. And I tried, and they resisted. And their lives have taken trajectories that are really different than the trajectory that a newly saved person should be taking. Now still, God knows. I hope they were saved. I hope they were saved and then just said, okay, I'll, I'll get saved, but man, I'm following the carnal path of life. I'd rather that happen than them not be saved. But man, I, I tell you, they prayed because I was their friend. That's what I think happened. They didn't pray because they wanted to accept Christ. Does that make sense? And so when you pray because someone who your friend is trying to get you to do it, you're not getting saved. You're just trying to please your friend. So that's why training is important, uh, so that we can do it right. Being a consistent, productive soul winner requires training. Now let's talk about the stages of growth for the soul winner. Now let me say first, you're going to go through these stages, or you've already gone through them. But no matter what, you, you may find yourself somewhere in the middle of this. Or you may say, yeah, and that's why I don't do it anymore. Because I tried it, and this is what happened. This is what we're going to talk about. Now, here's the thing. You can go more rapidly through these stages if you want to. And you'll see as we go along. So, stages of growth for the soul winner. Number one, you go. You go. You got to go. Soul winners that don't go aren't soul winners. Number two, you go and no one listens. You go and no one listens. Now let me tell you why no one listens. You don't know how to talk to people yet. That's why. I'm not putting you down. I'm not being condescending. I'm just saying this is why they don't listen. They don't listen because you're boring, you're pushy, you're rude. I don't know why, but there's some reason they're not listening to you. And as you get your feet, you're going to go, but people aren't going to listen to you. Number three, and by the way, none of us gets everyone to listen to us all the time. So it's not just always you. A lot of times it's them. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Number three, you go and someone finally gets saved. You go and someone finally gets saved. I don't have time for this whole story, but 
those of you who've been around here heard illustration number 141. Uh, one of our young teenagers in our, our youth department was soul winning with me one day, and we were in a nice upper middle class neighborhood, and there's this guy in his driveway hand washing his classic muscle car, and uh, it was Josh's turn to talk. We went up to the guy, and Josh sounded like a robot, and he sounded like he had no personality, and he sounded dull and monotone, and, and you know, Josh was my partner that day, and Josh was that way at every door. And this guy's washing his car, and, and as Josh is talking to him, the guy stops washing his car, he starts listening to Josh. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a really nice guy. He's really listening to this teenage boy. He must be a Christian already, uh, and he's feeling sorry for this kid, so he's hearing him out. And Job, or Josh asks him if he's a Christian, if he knows for sure he's on his way to heaven. Guy says, you know, I don't know that. Josh says, well, if you'll let me, I'll take the Bible, only not at all like that, just as terribly as it can be done. And he takes the next 15 or 20 minutes to witness to this man. And then he says, you know, would you let me pray with you so you can get saved? And the guy said, yes. And I couldn't believe it. And it was the Holy Spirit at that moment who pretty much said, yeah, because I do the saving. While Josh is talking to the man's face, the Holy Spirit's talking to his heart. And Josh won that man to Christ that day. It was huge, tremendous. And so you keep going, and you keep talking to people, and you get through all the people that don't want to listen to you because you're terrible. Eventually, you'll get somebody who will listen to you, and they will get saved. You just can't quit before you get there. And too many people do. Because too many people want the easy way out. And soul winning is not easy. I shouldn't say this because I don't want to, uh, you know, be a downer, but I never want to go soul winning. My flesh, that is. My flesh never wants to go. I'm like you. You know, we try to eat around 5.30, 6 o'clock, and, and then at soul winning time, got to get up, get in the car at 6.30, winter time it's cold and snowy and dark and windy in the summertime it's too nice I could do something in the yard we could go you know walk in the park uh, we could do that project around the house that I never get to get to uh, the same things pull at me is pull at you and so you just got to go and and you got to be consistent about it next you go you go and no one listens you go and someone finally gets saved number four you go win them and they do not come and by do not come I mean do, do not come to church because as soon as you win somebody to Christ the next thing you should do is invite them to come to church with you man I tell you what this is the greatest day of your life you may not realize it just yet but you just put faith in Jesus Christ every one of your sins has been completely forgiven and you have a home in heaven now and you didn't have that 20 minutes ago this is the most important day of your life. Hey, would you come to church with me on Sunday? Man, I'd love to have you be my guest. Sit beside me. I'll pick you up in the morning. You know, we can ride to church together. You can sit beside me. I'd love for you to meet my pastor. Say it whether you mean it or not. And uh, I'd love for you to meet my pastor and just to, to meet my, my church. And you try to get them to church. So you're going to do that. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. And then you're going to text them Saturday night. Hey, just making sure you know that I'm going to swing by and pick you up at 930. Yeah, 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 I'm waiting on you. 930 comes. You're going to drive your car to their house, and there's not going to be any cars in the driveway. The house is going to be dark. You go up to the door, and you're going to knock on it. Nobody's going to answer. You're going to listen real quiet. The dogs are going to be barking. Nobody's coming, and nobody's telling the dogs to shut up. Why? they're not coming and you will have that happen dozens of times I'm sorry hundreds of times I'm sorry if you're at it long enough thousands of times it'll happen you go you win them they do not come what happens next though if you stay at it number five you go win them and they come but 
they do not get baptized and they do not come back. This is an uplifting Bible study, isn't it? But it's true. You're going to get them to come once. Man, at the barber shop, I invite all the barbers that cut my hair. And, and one time this lady's like, man, you really help me when you're in my chair. And, and she tells me prayer requests. And her son was in Afghanistan. And, and, I, and she's like, I'm coming to church. I'm like, good. She was already saved. Uh, she came to church, sat right where Matea's sitting. After service came up and said, do you preach like that all the time? I don't know whether the duck or bucker, right? And uh, I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Said, I've never had anyone teach the Bible to me in a way that I could so clearly understand it. It's phenomenal. Thank you. I'll be back. I haven't seen her since. She quit the barber shop. I haven't seen her there. Gone, right? That was the best thing since sliced bread, man. Gone. Never see her again. It happens. Uh, next, number six, you go. You win them. They come. They do get baptized. And they do not come back. Because here's what you and I think. And I still think this. Man, if I can get you in the water, I got you. If I can get you in the water, I can get you to stick faithful to the Lord. And I'll tell you, it's the funniest thing in the world. We had a young lady named Giovanna King. She came on Easter Sunday about three years ago. Giovanna came, sat second or third row, right in the center, and, uh, you know, she had a rough upbringing, clearly a rough upbringing. She's covered in tattoos, neck tattoos. Once you got tattoos on the neck, you've really been down a road, haven't you? And uh, her whole chest had her name across the front, and uh, she was dressed not exactly appropriate for a lady for church. And uh, she came, and she got saved that day. She came the next week, and the third week she came and got baptized. She came one or two more weeks, and then she vanished. And then I tried to find her at home week after week, and then a couple, you know, if I visit you half a dozen times, and I can't even catch you home. I got other people to see, too. We stayed after, though, pretty regular. And then after uh, about eight or nine months, we found her at home again, and she said, you know what? I'm coming. I'll be there. Except before Sunday, her and two other guys went to a house on the east side and shot and killed three people. And Giovanna's still in jail. She hasn't even been tried for. So that's what happens to my converts. Huh? And you know what? If she was sincere and put her faith in Christ, she's saved. You may not like that, but you're as wicked as she is. You just don't like to admit it. No, next, number seven. You go. You win them. They come. They do get baptized. And they do come back. It happens eventually. But you know what? They're not always really consistent. Someone called me recently, said, I'm interested in your church because I understand that you witness to people and try to help people get saved. I said, we do try to do that. And they said, well, we want to come to your church then. So uh, they came, they've come, they still come. I'm really on shaky ground here. They were here Sunday. I announced that I'm going to teach on how to be a laborer for God and how to win souls to Christ and how to get people into church. And they're not here tonight. This is why they wanted to come. And they're not here. Now, I'm not picking on them. Who knows? They might have gotten car wrecked tonight. I don't know. They may have had to work late. I don't know. All I know is it takes a while. It takes a real long while. And I'll tell you, in our day and age, I heard a guy discuss it yesterday on the radio. talk show was talking about, uh, there, there was an article came out, I think only 40% of people believe that God should be a part of their lives. Americans. 40% of Americans believe that God should be a part of their lives. I mean, 60% don't. So they were talking about this on the radio. And the man called up and said, you know, my wife and I, we're, we're avid churchgoers, we're Christian, excuse me, Christian people. Uh, we raised our kids to be so. 
none of our children, none of their spouses, none of their children are in church today. My wife and I still are. None of them are. And he went on to say, and they're not bad people, but I describe them as secular people. You know, they, they, they're, they're moral. They're family-oriented. They, you know, they, they try to keep their kids in line, keep them doing right. They just don't care about God at all. And we're in that kind of society now. We didn't used to be that way. We used to live in a country where if you needed gas for Sunday, you better get it Saturday night because Sunday was the Lord's Day and everything's closed on the Lord's Day. Huh? You still run into some old timers that don't want to go out to eat on Sunday. They're 80, 85, 90 years old because they were just brought up. You don't trade on the Lord's Day. And, and by going to eat in a restaurant on a Sunday, you're keeping somebody else out of the house of God. Now, those of us who will eat on a Sunday, we're saying, well, they wouldn't be in the house of God whether I ate there or not. Uh, that's our way to compromise about it, right? <clears throat> but my point is simply this. We have an increasingly secular society. So when I got saved, man, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, soul winning. That was what I grew up on. And if you've noticed, that's what we encourage and emphasize around here. I think you ought to come to at least one of the Sunday schools on Sunday, either 9 a.m. or 5 p.m. And then 10 a.m. service, 545 night service, Wednesday night, and at least a soul winning time, whether it be Thursday night or if you go out on Saturday on a bus route. I think that's a good schedule for a Christian to keep concerning their, their church. But we've got families that, man, Sunday morning, that's what they're here for, and that's all they believe is necessary or helpful. And it's because of that secularization. And it takes a while to get people to grow to that point, you see. What else? we got to hurry. Was that number seven I already gave you? Okay, so number eight. You go, win them, they come, they do get baptized, they do come back, they stick stick. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people who will stick in the Lord's work. Now, if we can't get them to stick, we still want to go after them. We still want to win them. We still want to get them to come. We still want to get them baptized. We're trying to bring people down the whole road. Aaron's back there tonight. Now, Aaron was already saved when Katrina met him. Aaron has already been scripturally baptized, I presume, Aaron. Oh, we baptized you here, didn't we? Oh, not, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I'm confused. Sorry, I don't mean to make a spectacle of you, Aaron. But he's sticking, right? Is that fair to say, Aaron? I'd say you're here on a Wednesday night, and he was here this afternoon washing window sills. That's pretty much sticking, amen? And, and, it'll, and so who, who's responsible? Katrina. If you notice, she goes after people. She's got people in these pews all the time that you've never seen. We're still after half of them. Lavelle, if you're out there, right? And you can get people to stick too. Honestly, and I know I'm getting really secular based here, it's a numbers game. You put in one job application, you're probably not going to get a job. You put in 50, you're probably going to get some calls back. You just have to go after the numbers. Let's finish up here. It's 8.30. It takes time to develop as a soul winner. It takes effort to become a good soul winner. It takes consistency to become a good soul winner. This progression that I just gave you, one through eight, is normal and natural. And that's why it's important that we do not give up. You can't just go once and then be done with it. Oh, that didn't work. It's not like that. Anyone can become anything they want to become with enough practice. Now let me say, I'm not playing in the NBA, right? I'm too old, I'm too heavy, and I'm too short. But I'll tell you what, with enough practice, I could become very good at the fundamentals of basketball. 
put me with other short, slightly heavy, slightly heavy. Uh, don't, Dan, you're laughing too hard at that, brother. You might be in my boat with me. I don't know. I'm not saying. But, uh, but you put me on a, on, a, on a church league with some dudes like me, I could become pretty good at it. I can hit more free throws than Shaq. Huh? I'm watching the NCAA, uh, a clip from the NCAA girls basketball tournament uh, this morning. This guy put this clip online, and it looked like a bunch of third grade girls. Nobody could handle the ball. Every time they put it up, and they're right near the basket, they're missing every shot. One girl breaks away. Her teammate gets the ball, passes down the court to her. She dribbles all the way down. She's all by herself for a layup and misses. That's NCAA college ball, Division One, Huh? Practice. You say, man, that guy's really good at playing the piano. You know how he got that way? Practice. Let me tell you this. We're done. We overemphasize the importance of natural talent. I believe that wholeheartedly. We overemphasize the importance of natural talent. Whatever you lend your hand to more than any other thing else is what you get good at. Brooks a great small engine mechanic. You know why? That's what he does. My dad is a great carpenter. You know why? That's what he spends his time doing. Talon and Winston have been up here helping with the, the audio and video. If you notice back here, we've got Talon, we've got Ashton, we got Aaron. Who else helps you back there? Elijah's been back there helping. Everybody I've just named is young. Why are they so good at it? They get tech stuff because it's what their generation has been steeped in. We tried putting Mike Platts back there. You notice Mike's not back there much anymore. Why? Mike's old. It didn't come to him as naturally. But you know what? Mike could be as good as talent if he put the time in. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Quit excusing things because oh, I, I just wasn't born with that gift. Nobody's born with that gift. You just do it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. All right, that's all we have time for tonight. Good thing we didn't have a business meeting. I ran my mouth the whole time, didn't I? All right, ushers, come on down. Let's receive our offering at this time, please. If you still haven't purchased your Hatfield McCoy shirt, please do so. They're right over here. Ellen is going to help you right after the service and uh, get those things done. You can start wearing them and uh, getting about the town. That's your icebreaker right there. You say, I don't like to start conversations with people. Good, put on a silly shirt and make them ask you what your shirt's all about, right? What, what's this hillbilly on the front of your shirt? Oh, our pastor's crazy. That's a good way to start any conversation. But anyway, our pastor's crazy. We're getting ready to go into a spring campaign, trying to invite people to church, and we divided the church into families, Hatfields and the McCoys. And I'm a McCoy, or I'm a Hatfield. You need to come to help my team win. And you hand them a track, and you tell them where we are, and you push it. Brother Rick, would you pray for the offer? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Oh, good.
802. Wow. Man. Amen. That's true. Yes, sir. I understand that, brother. Thank you. So my takeaway from that is no longer have Rick Mitchell here. That's what <laughs> Yes, sir. Good call. Yeah, absolutely. Pray for all of the people that have been inviting. And I've been hearing from all of you this week. I'll pray for this, or I won this person to Christ, or I've invited this person. Pray for all these efforts, would you, uh, that they come this Sunday for Easter Sunday, or even, you know, if they don't make it this week, beyond that for sure. All right. Can you pray now, Brother Rick, with that one? As they take the offering, here's your announcements. Uh, as we mentioned, see Ellen for your Hatfield and McCoy shirts tonight. Contest has already begun. So you get people here any Sunday morning, any Sunday night, any Wednesday night, or any of the two revival services, Monday, Tuesday night, all right? Then, let's see here, spring cleaning week. We passed around this, this form, and many, many of you have signed up. We even had a couple things. Uh, uh, there are only a couple things that didn't get covered. If you signed up, uh, please make sure you follow through. We were hoping by this, uh, goodness, I lost my train of thought here, by Easter Sunday to have all that stuff done. That was the idea. So if you can do that, we would appreciate it. Keep it in prayer Easter Sunday uh, for the folks who've been invited to come, for those who do come that are lost to hear the gospel and be saved, those who are out of church or backslidden to get right with God and get back in the house of God. Uh, we've had so far uh, this year 12 salvations I think nine baptisms, phenomenal. And uh, don't forget your Easter invites. And I'm going to cut it off there. They're here in the track rack. And uh, take as many as you need. Lucy, the eggs rolling in yet? Got almost all of them back. If you still happen to have Easter eggs at home and you can bring them, please bring them Sunday morning and we can get things going there. All right. Thanks for being here.